Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I would like to thank the musicians that have already left because they had to catch the train and the evenings always start a little late. Excuses for that. Uh, if there are a few people who want to sit a bit up front, there are still a few seats there and a few seats there that you can, if you, if you have a bad seat, come up and sit uh, in the front, but leave one seat for me, please. <laughs> Jaap, die twee voor jou, voor mij, jou en voor mij vooraan, oké? Okay? Ja, en voor Jaap, die daarnaast. Mr. Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this evening with the legendary economist John Kenneth Galbraith. Mr. Galbraith, welcome to Amsterdam. The John Adams Institute is more than honored to have you as our guest in the lecture series American Focus. My name is Anne Wertheim. I'm the director of the John Adams Institute and as many of you are not familiar here tonight with the John Adams Institute, I would like to point out that we organize two lecture series, American Focus and American Literature Today, which bring American men and women of arts and letters to the city of publishers, Amsterdam. You can find more information about us in the little black folder. The John Adams Institute receives no government funding we exist solely on the kind donations of donors, friends, and benefactors. And we operate on a very low budget. So with so many economists in this hall, <laughs> I cannot resist the temptation of asking you all to become a donor, friend, or benefactor. And I would like to point out that we plan to be creating the best lecture center of Europe in Amsterdam. I would like to thank the publisher Antos, Penguin Books, the University of Amsterdam who gave us this hall, and our volunteers for making this evening possible. Professor Galbraith will be introduced by Jan Bijshuizen, former economic editor with Het Parool, and as far as I know, and as far as Professor Galbraith knows, the only person in the world to have received a PhD on Dr. Galbraith. <laughs> Following his introduction, Mr. Bijshuizen will give the floor to Professor Galbraith. In the second half of the program, Professor Heertje will join the group. And the audience is allowed to participate in the discussion. Professor Galbraith, has agreed to sign a limited amount of books after the evening is over. It will be around 10, 10 o'clock. There will be no intermission. Photographers are kindly asked to restrict their work to the first 10 minutes of Mr. Galbraith's lecture. No more photographs may be taken after that, except for our house photographer, Chris van Houts. <laughs> Thank you, enjoy your evening. Mr. Bijzenhuizen, may I ask you to come to the podium. Thank you very much. Amé, ladies and gentlemen. It is for me a privilege and pleasure to present to you the world famous American economist and social critic, John Kenneth Galbraith. I think Dr. Galbraith, emeritus professor at Harvard University, friend of the Kennedy family, ex-ambassador to India, and indefatigable writer of a, of a number of bestsellers, hardly needs an introduction. 
Still, it may be useful to give you very briefly an idea of who's who. This is easier said than done, since he, at 87 now, is still a very busy man. Paul Samuelson, longtime guru of American economics, once called him a versatile giant. This giantism has evidently to do with his height of six feet, eight and a half inches, or well over two meters. He often jokes about it, saying, I am the greatest economist of the world, that's for sure. <laughs> Versatile is, in the first place, his colorful career. He rose from simple teacher to full professor, but in between, he held several jobs in the public service. He was, for instance, a successful wartime chief price controller, and later, investigator of the effect of Allied bombing on Germany and Japan. As ambassador to India in the early 60s, he, as he tells with obvious satisfaction, helped to cool a border war with China. His free time, so to speak, was and is for his journalistic work in writing or as a commentator on radio and television. As a confirmed liberal, in the American sense of the word, he has been an active member of the Democratic Party, campaigner, advisor, and speechwriter for presidential candidates. Besides all this, he is a firm supporter of the rights of women and the African Americans. A passionate traveler, he has been all over the world. His many-sidedness is apparent also from the list of his publications which for an economist shows a remarkable diversity. Apart from an endless number of articles in newspapers, magazines, and professional journals, the list shows some 40 books, for the most part on economics or economic and political history, with the Great Crash 1929 as a real gem of his wonderful style of writing. Incidentally, he likes to quip that the book with this title will never be for sale at airports. <laughs> he has also written some biographical works, among which his here and there highly amusing ego trip, A Life in Our Times. To his name, he also has two novels, one of which lampoons American foreign policy, a satire on vanity and egocentricity, and, most surprising, a book written together with an Indian expert on Indian painting. His only writing, he says, to which no one has ever taken serious exception. Most criticized is his proposition on the disequilibrium between the market and the state, typified by the famous dictum, private opulence and public squalor, one finds in his masterwork, The Affluent Society. This appeared in 1958, but its basic idea is still very relevant, as he has shown some years ago in The Culture of Contentment, where that disequilibrium goes hand in hand with an ever-present tension between the rich and the poor, a theme he has further worked out in his latest book titled The Good Society, that will appear this year. Although many of his ideas have bearing mainly on the United States, his books, if necessary in translation, were and still are read and appreciated all over the world. Here in the Netherlands, the late Prime Minister Joop den Uyl was at the time so impressed, not to say possessed by what Professor Galbraith had said in the affluent society, that a fellow party member, well-known Dr. Willem Drees, once dubbed him Professor Albrecht. <laughs> However, among his American colleagues, his position is rather controversial. This becomes clear from the widely diverting, not to say contradictory, opinions about his person and work. One of his defenders, by the right here and now so suitable name of John Adams, describes this clash of opinions as esteem and honor coupled with calumny and hostility. 
It has been suggested that from a third to half of all members of the American Economic Association, the professional organization, are not Galbraith fans, whereas an equally considerable number are sympathizers or even strong backers. On the occasion of his 80th birthday, 26 good friends, among whom our Jan Tinbergen, offered him a Liber Amicorum under the well-chosen title, Unconventional Wisdom. Indeed, as an economist, Galbraith goes his own uncon unconventional way with a highly personal, clearly liberal approach to the problems of society. He is out of the mainstream of economic thought and even is one of its strongest critics. This has enriched economic literature with sometimes acrimonious but often amusing quarrels. His antipode, both politically as well as to his view of economic theory and reality, is the deeply conservative Chicago professor of monetary economics, Milton Friedman, who has not always been kind to Galbraith. So the relation between both appears to the outsider as rather tense. In the days of dictator Pinochet, Friedman has acted as an economic advisor of Chile. When he was publicly accused of supporting a highly improper regime, Galbraith defended him as a true friend of freedom, but at the same time reveled in the ruin of the Chilean economy to which Friedman's views would no doubt lead. And when someone told him that the Indian government considered recruiting Friedman as a counselor in view of its five-year plan, Galbraith responded that asking Milton Friedman to advise on economic planning was like asking the Holy Father to counsel on birth control. <laughs> One of the authors in the Liber Amicorum states that he, unlike the majority of his colleagues, shows a warm and abiding interest in the flesh and blood folks that run the economy. This, I think, is the highest praise an economist can get. May I now invite you, Professor Galbraith, to take the floor. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador. <clears throat> My distinguished introducer, may I begin by saying how delighted I was listening to that very eloquent introduction, all of it true, <laughs> and uh, of my pleasure in being here at this institute, and uh, my pleasure in seeing so many of you here this evening, all uniformly prosperous in appearance, proving to me that the Netherlands, Holland, is still the center of economic life to which we all must look. Let me also express my appreciation for the extraordinary engineering arrangements that have been made <clears throat> to allow me to see my notes here. <clears throat> I, was <clears throat> I was at a pleasant dinner last night, and the, this extraordinary development here reminds me that I used that occasion, and I now repeat a uh, governing rule of my life. Uh, it was <clears throat> I hope I may be forgiven if I re am repeating myself a little. It was my <clears throat> I was many years ago at a large meeting in Washington, and I was summoned into the presence of Charles de Gaulle, who said to me, Professor, what is your philosophy 
of your vast height. <laughs> I'd written this out. <clears throat> There's nothing like plagiarizing yourself. So I said, well, Mr. President, we tall men are taller than anybody else. Therefore, we're more visible. It follows that our behavior is better. And so the world instinctively trusts tall men. <laughs> General de Gaulle said, magnifique. Uh, and then in a great voice, which I cannot imitate, he said, but there is one thing you have forgotten. The small men must be treated without mercy. <laughs> As I say, this was a large political gathering in Washington, and as he said that, the newspaper reporters, seeing these two rather tall people talking together, came up and dem demanded to know what politician General de Gaulle was referring to. They didn't believe it was that we, either of us was capable of anything approaching humor. <laughs> Let me also tell you of my pleasure in being here in Holland and the <clears throat> honor you accord me in this great institute <clears throat> inviting, in inviting me to give this lecture. In keeping with the request of my host this evening, I'm centering my comments on a book that has just been published here in the Netherlands. There is, it is known, no greater source of gratification for an author than talking and reflecting on his own work. My concern is with the economic and political world as I have observed it over the last 60 years. And one of our oldest debates, I might notice, is over the utilitarian, the useful role of history. Are those who have, ex have not explored its errors and more than occasional insanities <clears throat> destined to repeat them? This doesn't especially interest me. In any case, it is a question that will forever remain unsolved. My interest this evening is in historical discovery for its own sake, in the pleasure that, it, that in this formidably utilitarian world comes from knowledge, or what I trust may be so described, not for its value, but for the satisfaction it accords. And it is in this spirit that I speak to you here tonight. Of the spirit of claims to the resulting enlightenment, I will pass over. I will seek to be modest, surprising as that may be, to many of who have, uh, to anyone who has known me over the years. And <clears throat> it will be devoted to how we may better live in the world of today as we reflect on experience from the First World War down to the present time. There has been in these years from the first great war, the, I think four factors which come to attention uh, and which uh, should be emphasized as part of the experience of that time. One of them is the need for escape the need for escape from the attitudes of the one-time controlling landed interest and its residual, I emphasize that word, residual effects. This also, one must conclude, has been the essential to the escape from military adventure and conflict and also 
an escape from a certain simplistic inadequacy in the conduct of public affairs. That is because political and military position once defended, depended not on ability, not on intelligence, but on inherited land holding. Second, a related matter for this considerable part of our century and continuing in our own time is the very depressing role of mental inadequacy and error in economic behavior and public policy. A certain human tendency to which we only reluctantly admit and which can be called, perhaps best, highly cultivated stupidity. <laughs> there is third, as economics has developed as a guiding subject in economic and political policy, its tendency to gravitate <coughs> to, <coughs> to and concentrate on the, the easy and seemingly felicitous courses of public action. Not those that are administratively or intellectually burdensome. Ah, thank you very much. Some years ago, um, <clears throat> I was giving a lecture in Indiana as one of four speakers. And I was there, Mr. Ambassador, with a Southern senator well known to you who combined length of oratory with the minimum of depth. <laughs> and halfway through that evening, as I have just experienced it, he had an attack of something in his throat. And he said, when he got a glass of water tinkling with ice, don't you think, no, that ice water is very bad for the vocal cords? And I sit that there, sat there that evening, along with almost a thousand other people who were listening and thinking what a good thing ice water could be. <laughs> I trust that that is not the effect here tonight. <laughs> Fourth, there is a passive but powerful influence of economic policy, which is now evident in the far greater concern for inflation than for unemployment, for price stability, even at high social cost. Finally, a related matter, there is in the modern world a strong tendency to prefer a poorly working economy to the discomforts of high and rapid economic growth, and, a, and especially to prefer stability to the action that requires economic growth. On this preference, there is a convention of silence. Those who serve that survive and on occasion even prefer modest economic performance as compared with strong economic performance are constrained from ever mentioning it. You must not ever say you prefer a recession. Better on balance, in the United States at least, Holland may be more generous, <clears throat> but it's far better in the United States <clears throat> to be charged with sexual harassment. <laughs> now, <clears throat> now, on each of these matters, I will have a word. From the most ancient to the very recent times, the accepted basis for economic well-being was the possession of land. From this came social position and political power, and from the urge to possess land also came military conflict. 
The continuing jealous political and military concern for frontiers, on occasion protecting real estate one might hope would belong to someone else. This is the continuing and residual resi residue of this ancient commitment. It caused and was used to justify the death of millions. It was also a source of other economic effort. I remember some 20 or 25 years ago having dinner here in Holland one night with the then Secretary of Agriculture of the Netherlands. He was in a confiding mood. And I asked him about the continued reclamation of the Zuider Zee. And he said, well, he said, I do not object to that. He said, I don't mind spending money for the reclamation of that land. It is only the terrible cost of the subsidies to the farmers once we have reclaimed it. <laughs> I've <clears throat> uh, had that in mind ever since whenever I visited this lovely country. I think there was a time, unquestionably, when its reclamation was a good thing. But to return to the matter of landed interest. At the end of World War II, I was a member of the team that interrogated Nazi officials and German generals as the war came to an end and they came into our custody. And we were told one day by one general, it was General Alfred Jodl, one of Hitler's, as they were called, nodding donkeys. And these were his exact words. He said, you are trying to kill Germany. We want to fight wars in the old way and give up a province or two when we lose. That, in the minds of one of the highest of German generals, was the nature of a military achievement. That was what wars were about, territory. The modern economy dominated by industry, trade, and finance, and as no one should doubt, by technology, and by other knowledge and the arts and entertainment, is a far more peaceful entity than a world that was dominated by the search for land. The land and interest also was hostile to economic development. So it remains to this day in much of Central and South America <coughs> and the Philippines. <coughs> and so, Mr. Ambassador, it was for a long time in the American South. It is con con it is contentment with its it is content with its power and position, the land it interest is. It sees no reason for change. In the southern United States, in one lifetime, the removal of the old plantation owners from their land, the free and exemption of the sharecroppers from duty and bondage, was a great force for economic advance, also for civil rights, and this we now see. I address these remarks to our ambassador because he comes from Atlanta, one of the most progressive cities in the Western world, and a progressive city because it was, has, in modern times, been exempt from landed influence. Owner-operated agriculture is not hostile to economic development. The two go well together, but neither is an agricultural base now essential for economic development. Let us bear in mind that in the last 50 years, two of the most spectacular examples of economic advance, Hong Kong and Singapore, have had no farmers at all no landed territory at all. Was that an advantage? 
Once, as I've noted, Holland was committed to large resources, committed large resources to the reclaiming of land from the sea. Now I judge no longer. Land for economic life is no longer seen in this lovely country as important for economic well-being. The residue of this commitment to territory does still continue. We've read in the papers these last days of the attitude of conflict between Greece and Turkey, two, two members of NATO, over a non-inhabited piece of land in the Mediterranean. This is the residue of attitudes which still associate national prestige with the owner, ownership of acreage square meters. Now, next I come to the role, the unspoken role of mental inadequacy, more abruptly called stupidity, in the broad course of history. And equally, where military and industrial and financial decisions are involved. We always look in a tolerant way for a plausible controlling cause of something that has happened. Too often we pass over simple and wholly implausible foolishness. As to military stupidity, there will perhaps be a measure of agreement. How else, for, for example, could one explain so colossal an error as the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941? or the decision almost immediately by Hitler to declare war in the, on the United States. Hitler is remembered as a cruel tyrant. He was also more than slightly insane. In Washington, during those tense days immediately following the attack on Pearl Harbor, those of us responsible for public policy and I was so responsible in a more than modest way, we were caught up in the fear that the Japanese action on Pearl Harbor would force all public and political attention in the United States to the Pacific. This would, for the defeat of fascism and the defeat of Nazism, would have been a terrible thing. And it would have not have been a particularly good thing for the country where I speak tonight. Then suddenly, and wholly without expectation, we were rescued by Germany by a colossal act of stupidity. That was the declaration by Hitler of war in the United States. And the memory of the surprise at that action <clears throat> and the relief of that action is still with me. <clears throat> This tendency to military aberration, regularly supported by civilians seeking to show a hard-headed attitude on such matters, is unhappily not limited to former enemies. We saw it sadly in our own country during the depressing years of the Vietnam War. Here was the belief that countries that had never experienced capitalism were ripe for communism and would be an eventual political and military threat to the United States and what was called the free world. I was sent to Vietnam in the autumn of 1961 by Kennedy, and I remember especially one Sunday being taken with an armed escort on a drive through the country north of Saigon. And my thought on that drive, as I say, I still retain. It was, how did one ever tell a communist jungle from a free enterprise and democratic jungle? You would be astonished at how much alike they really were. <laughs> 
This, is a, this was a question that remained durably in my mind during that whole unfortunate episode of the Vietnam War. But we must say that mental inadequacy is not in co confined to military matters. One cannot review the economic history of our time, of all time, without being impressed by the regular descents into financial error, again verging close on insanity. Here again, I must say with pleasure that Holland was a pioneer. I refer, of course, to that greatest of all speculative episodes, the tulip mania of the 17th century. There was much later in the Dutch tradition. The speculation initiated by John Law in Paris in the early 18th century. The South Sea bubble in Britain in almost the same years. The several speculative outlets, outbreaks in the United States in the last century. The great stock market speculation of the 1920s. And the savings and loan juke bond, junk bond, and mergers and acquisitions mania of the 1980s. All examples, as I say, of economic descent into what can only be called the controlling role of stupidity. In fact, each new generation in the economic world has been inspired by the belief that some new and compelling economic decision would make it greatly and deservedly rich. This was, in fact, only the discovery once again, of, once again that a rising price could cause innocence to enter the market, that this would then cause prices to rise more, and by so justifying expectation, bring more purchases, purchasers into the market, and money would be borrowed to, to buy whatever was being sold, the so-called miracle of leverage, and all of this will continue until the day of the final reckoning <clears throat> when the supply of innocence is exhausted and there comes the inevitable crash. So it has been in the past, so it will be in the future. So it may be now in New York with the current mutual fund explosion. This could be the fate of the eager young men and women who now administer the seemingly new world of the cash excessive mutual funds. I, it is my personal thought that that may be so. No reading of history in any case can escape the conclusion that of all the instruments of error, none greatly exceeds that in error of the celebrated financial genius. Of him or her, anyone so described, we must always be war warned. It is also a warning which, we may be assured, few people will heed. I come now to a narrower focus, to the problems of economic policy and how that has emerged over the years. Since the 1930s and the enduring influence of John Maynard Keynes, economics and economic policy have divided into two parts. There is microeconomics and macroeconomics. Microeconomics is concerned with the behavior of markets, with price and wage determination, with the efficiency of the industrial firm, with inter-industry relationships, and the quality and general effectiveness of the labor force. Macroeconomics, in contrast, is concerned with the broad sweep of economic behavior and associated public policy, with the factors affecting the aggregate of demand for all goods and services. And from this comes the level of employment, 
and the threat or reality of inflation. And concern for the relevant central bank policy and the appropriate taxation and public expenditure. In common language, monetary and fiscal policy. University instruction in economics, to which many of you, however reluctantly, have been exposed, now divides as a matter of course between microeconomics and macroeconomics. So does academic specialization, and so does public policy. <clears throat> no one can doubt <clears throat> that in a, for an, that no one can doubt that to an effectively working economy, both microeconomics and macroeconomics are su supremely relevant. Must, one must have a well-educated, well-motivated labor force, an alert, competent, innovative industrial management, an investment notably in technology, but also, and importantly, in the arts, and in science, investment that is beyond the time horizons of the individual firm. It is also agreed that price stability can be impaired by microeconomic market action, as by the petroleum cartel <clears throat> in the late 1970s, and more generally by wage price interaction, the wage price spiral, and that living standards can be impaired by pollution, climactic, <clears throat> and other environmental degradation and that life in our great cities, and notably and happily this is so in the United States, can be held in hostage by a poverty-ridden, poverty-stricken underclass. There has been, nonetheless, a powerful rep preference in economics and economic policy making for macroeconomic as opposed to the microeconomic problems I have just mentioned. A strong preference for monetary and fiscal policy, for central bank action, for tax and expenditure decisions. These are the modern preoccupation. They have a straightforward handoff quality. They are almost hygienic in the way in which they can be discussed and viewed. No difficulty, no distracting problems of administration <clears throat> are involved for those who talk about monetary policy, for example. And it is with such decision-making that those now guiding economic policy greatly prefer to be involved. This is especially true, I repeat, of monetary policy. How good it is to, good it is to leave every, anything as troublesome as unemployment, <clears throat> anything as painful as inflation, to the well-mannered men, and now a few women, who assemble for civilized discussion in the stately chambers of the central banks. I have mentioned the energy crisis of the 1970s. One possible solution then was to seek to limit demand and thus stabilize prices by a relatively modest rationing and price control effort. This was something I personally urged, and I cannot doubt that it would have worked. However, it was far easier to turn the case over to the central bank and to have a regime of high interest rates, tight money, rising prices, rising prices and unemployment, and stagflation. And this was, was something from which the whole world economy suffered. And there is still the temptation, still very much the reality, to repeat, to repeat this error. In fact, in our time, much depends on a well-educated labor force. 
Public schools are of central economic importance. <clears throat> In no industrial country does the market system provide good housing for the poor. The distribution and maldistribution of income must be a major concern. As we saw during the 1980s, the modern corporate world can still incorporate a self-destructive tendency, a point that I have already emphasized. All of this is of urgent importance, but all of this is subject to the damaging tendency to look at the present larger questions of macroeconomic policy and to have far more attention lavished on monetary policy and tax and expenditure policy. These are much more popular. There's an element of mystery about them, and they command the attention of people away from the microeconomic questions which are so desperately urgent in our day. The point must again be emphasized. Economic policy is, ex is extensively determined not by what is right and effective, but what is, by what is administratively agreeable con and convenient. The time has now come when we must accept, must accord primary attention to the economic, to the microeconomic forces affecting economic well-being, to education, to housing, to employment opportunity in the central cities, and to wage price stability. These are matters which I emphasize particularly as an American coming out of our situation, but matters which have a high relevance to all of the advanced industrial countries. One can only be glad and somewhat surprised that in the great debate in my country over health care, nobody has yet suggested leaving it to the Federal Reserve System. <laughs> I come now to the powerful effect of political context and economic purpose. The prime example of this is the present concern for inflation as opposed to employment and economic growth. In the modern economy, a large and an increasing number of people live on relatively fixed incomes. And many people have cash reserves held against future need or old age. For both groups, rising prices, higher living costs, are a basic concern. No one wishes to see his or her income or reserves diminished in purchasing power by inflation. And even with index pensions, price increases attract more attention than the compensating increase in payment. Additionally, in the financial world, price stability the avoidance of inflation in modern times is what marks the good and intelligent policy. That is the priestly absolute to which all render obeisance. In consequence, inflation has become the worry of a large and politically and socially influential community. Unemployment, by contrast, is an affliction that is suffered by someone else. And notably in the United States, with the decline in trade union power, unemployment is suffered most by the politically voiceless. The result in all of the industrial countries is a strong concern for inflation and a concern, but a much more limited concern, for unemployment. As one surveys recent history, one is compelled to the belief that in the major industrial economies, 
unemployment has become the quietly accepted answer to price stability, something we rather willingly pay for price stability. This is a cruel resolution of an admittedly difficult choice. Is it not better, we must ask ourselves, that we suffer a modest increase in prices than that we inflict the truly devastating penalty of joblessness and income deprivation on a very large minority of our fellow citizens, along with the low quality and part-time employment that goes always with unemployment. It is not easy to come out for a regime of increasing price levels, however modest. There is also ingrained in the public and in some measure the professional mind what we may call the pregnancy theory of inflation. The pregnancy theory of, whole, of inflation holds that just as a woman cannot be a little bit pregnant, so an economy cannot have a little bit <clears throat> of inflation. It will always develop into something more. But this, indeed, the history denies. Over the years, and indeed over the generations, prices have inched up in our economies without the disaster of hyperinflation. And this is something we can accept as an alternative to mass unemployment, which we now accept. I come now to a final and related point, strikingly evident from the history. And let me tell you something that's very important. All of you, many of you here in this audience, in this enlightened audience, make speeches, give lectures, give instruction. Always at a certain point say you come finally to the point, because that gives your audience the hope, the hope that maybe soon it will be over. <laughs> I come now to a final and related point. It is especially the case in the United States, but it is very influential in the political life of the other industrial countries. That is the preference for a high, for the preference for a high unemployment and recession as against the public measures that might be taken to improve economic performance. This was so during the Great Depression, when I first became involved actively in economics. The economic initiatives of the Roosevelt administration, and note here the reference to a prominent Dutch name, the economic initiatives of the Roosevelt administration, work relief, public works, the farm program, the resulting deficit in the public accounts were all massively and bitterly opposed by the reputable business community, by the comfortably rewarded citizenry in general, and by many economists. No plausible alternative to the Roosevelt policies was offered. The practical effect was to accept the Great Depression. Not before and not since has an economic question so bitterly divided the United States. The only constraining factor was that no one, or certainly not anyone, ever wished to say that he favored the Depression. That was forbidden to voice and even to thought. The situation has been clear in these last years. At the beginning of the present decade, we had a low order of economic performance, a sharp continuing recession. For a large and influential part of the American community, and similarly in the other industrial countries, this was far from unpleasant. Living costs were stable, and the labor fixed income 
relationship, which I've just mentioned, didn't operate. Labor, unemployment being often the alternative, may have been more amenable, more cooperative. Services were well, even eagerly staffed. The great business executive, we don't use the word bureaucrat for the business executive, viewed the scene from a situation of some personal security. Some executives, management men and women, were shed, as it is now said. We don't use the word fired or sacked. People are just shed. Those in power and left in jobs were in the satisfactory position of being the ones who did the shedding. How much better all this than having the government intervene in a positive way to put people to work? Here, the danger of enlarged government and perhaps some future tax increase to cover the costs was decisive. Coming to office in 1993, President Clinton proposed a modest stimulus package to put people to work. It was quickly, almost enthusiastically, rejected. Since then, we've had a recovery as the speculative errors of the, of the 1980s have receded in memory and in effect, and a new set of errors quite possibly taking their place. Promptly and effusively, this has brought concern for inflation. Some have come perilously close to admitting the terrible truth. In the modern world, recession is quite tolerable, and better certainly, than the alternative. All economic doctrine and all political expression acclaim vigorously the need for an expanding economy. The comfortable reality is that quite a few people are quite content with poor economic performance. Well, such are some of the lessons of history of which in these past years I have been engaged. There were, I like to think, quite a few more lessons. After all, that is what my research, and rather more my reflection, ended up in bringing a book. History has its own separate and justified interests, however. But I conclude with a suggestion that it does have its value as a guide to intelligence in the present, as a guide to present understanding. And on this note, I take my leave. I must do so before uh, I finish by telling you again my pleasure in being here in Amsterdam and being here at this institute and now my pleasure in you as an audience. You have ever given every indication of listening to me patiently, uh, not, not without some feeling of that overwhelming hope that it will sometime end. You have been responsive when I thought response was called for. Let me tell you that as an audience, I love you very much.
Professor Heertje coming here on the stage. I can tell you, Professor Heertje was my guide to my doctorate, not so very long ago. And when I had the doctorate in my pocket, here in this same hall, on this spot, he came forward with an envelope, and that was an envelope from Cambridge, Massachusetts. And in that envelope was a letter from John Kenneth Galbraith. Congratulations. Thanks again, Professor Galbraith. <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs> Will you take a... Yeah, yeah. Mr. Ambassador, Professor Galbraith, ladies and gentlemen, even if we stop by now, we had or have already a great evening, not only for you, but also for the University of Amsterdam. We listened to two great introductions. We listened to a great speech by a great economist. And we are only looking forward now to a great discussion. If I say a great economist, I would like to point in particular to two important characteristics, as, as I see them, from Professor Galbraith. The first is that as an economist, he is able to think, to think in dimensions in terms of space and time. He is really a global thinker. That's the space dimension. But he is also a thinker from the past into the future. And in this sense, he is a thinker from the point of view of the time dimension. But there is also another important feature, and that is the feature also referred to by our late Professor Klant, who once said that all great economists, from Adam Smith to Marx, from Maltes to Keynes, not only liked to explain the world, but also liked to change the world. And I think Professor Galbraith is a very good exa example of that feature. If I may say so, he is more a mover of the world than an economic theorist. And I think he likes to be like that. Now, if, uh, for me, as a humble Dutch and even more restricted Amsterdam professor in economics, of course, it is a great privilege to start the discussion with uh, Professor Galbraith. And I would like to pick up two items from his speech. I do not like to go into his remark, remarks about Germany. I only mention them in passing, saying that I do not like to go uh, into them, because I have, uh, in that respect, quite another uh, experience. But the two topics I would like to introduce, and I hope that it will stimulate, and, uh, stimulate the discussion, the two topics are the question of inflation and unemployment, and the question of micro and macroeconomics. And I think both items are also important because they are, from a practical point of view, very relevant also for the Dutch economy. Just a few remarks about the question of inflation and unemployment. I have the impression here that Professor Galbraith is still thinking a little bit within the traditional Keynesian framework, as if inflation and unemployment are uh, uh, antagonistic. And uh, of course, if we put forward the question put forward by Professor Galbraith, whether we would like a modest rate of inflation compared with huge unemployment for a very large minority, the answer is very simple. We better would have a, a small rate of inflation instead of huge unemployment for a 
well, a, a huge part of the population. But I don't think that is the right question to ask. The question to be put forward is whether inflation is a, uh, a, a low rate of inflation or even a rate of inflation zero is a condition for lower rates of unemployment. And uh, in view of the structural character of unemployment nowadays, in particular thinking in global terms and looking at technical change, uh, the question may be raised whether inflation uh, would uh, really uh, endanger the situation with respect to unemployment instead of being of uh, much help. Of course, inflation in principle is easier to cope with, in particular with the help of monetary policy, and in Holland we experience a situation where we have a very subtle and very strong monetary policy, but also, I must say, a very effective monetary policy if we look, for example, at uh, the position of the Gilder on the, uh, uh, on the uh, uh, currency uh, market. Uh, and perhaps you might say it is monetary policy is, uh, is easy. Uh, it is easy to cope with inflation by help of monetary and uh, by the help of monetary and fiscal policy, and it is easier to cope with inflation than with uh, unemployment. But still, the question is even then uh, whether uh, inflation is not uh, uh, very dangerous uh, to cope with uh, unemployment. Um, so, if we have an economy with real prices, with real incomes, with real profits, and in particular with real interest, it might be that such an economy is, in a, is better placed to cope with unemployment than an economy where you have nominal prices, nominal wages, nominal profits, and uh, in, in particular high levels of nominal rates of interest. As soon as there is a uh, as soon as there are higher rates of inflation, you also have, of course, higher rates of interest, and that is very damaging from the point of view uh, of investment, for example. So, <clears throat> uh, to, to sum this up, to cope with uh, unemployment without inflation is already a major problem, and uh, with inflation, it becomes uh, even more a, a disaster. And I would uh, add in this connection that in my view, uh, for example, the Dutch government, but also other uh, governments, in fact, uh, are really concerned uh, in general about uh, uh, unemployment. Now the second, uh, uh, this is to a certain extent, I think, a, a very old debate about inflation and uh, unemployment. The, the second topic is uh, of much more interest. Uh, the topic, uh, the relationship between microeconomics and uh, macroeconomics. Uh, First of all, from the, point of, uh, from the point of view of economic theory, I would like to point out that um, macroeconomics nowadays is much more founded on microeconomics than in the old days than in the, days, in the old days of uh, Professor Galbraith, so to speak, and if I may say so, of myself, because I'm also a rather old man. Um, but um, there was the distinction between micro and macroeconomics was much stronger uh, 30, 50, 40 years ago. Uh, macroeconomic theory is, uh, to a large extent, also microeconomic theory based on the behavior of consumers, producers, and owners of the factors of production. And in both types of economic theory, both parts of economic theory, the theory of games uh, plays uh, a very important role. So already there, you see a lot of integration. Now, this integration is also reflected, I think, uh, in the sphere of economic policy and at the practical uh, level. In the sphere of economic policy, I would 
the, like to defend the position that there is less emphasis on mic macroeconomic policies, fiscal policies, monetary policies. They play a role, but they play a role more as a condition for economic policy and for the improvement of the economy than as a major <coughs> element uh, as such. And uh, I would like to refer to two parts in this connection. Competition policy. Uh, in the Dutch economy, I think, uh, competition uh, policy is becoming more and more important. Already, uh, the former Minister of Economic Affairs, who is also present here uh, tonight, but also the present Minister of Economic Affairs, uh, emphasized uh, highly the importance of competition, uh, of competition and of competition uh, policy. And uh, of course, in a global economy, potential competition and uh, actual competition is very important. Also, if we take into account the factor of the role of uh, technical change. Now, we see more and more emphasis on competition, and this is highly related, I think, uh, to microeconomic uh, ideas and uh, insights, also coming from uh, th uh, theory. The, the second interesting uh, development is that one, is, one realizes more and more that a very important source of economic growth, apart from labor, the quality of labor, and technical change, a very important source are uh, institutional changes, the changes in institutions. Every day you see that traditional structures are wiped out and that new institutional setups, set, uh, uh, that new institutions are uh, set up. And uh, that is uh, very important. And the, the relationship between rules, the relationship between the law and uh, economics is becoming more and more important. And that is, again, due partly to economic theory in the sense of economic analysis uh, of law. And I think that these, these ideas about institutional uh, changes uh, and uh, seeing the development of new uh, institutions, uh, they are more of a microeconomic character because they reflect also ideas about the behavior of bureaucrats, of uh, uh, the citizens as consumers or uh, producers, than they are of a macroeconomic uh, uh, nature. The major problem, one of the major problems, uh, both from the point of view of theory and uh, in practical life, I think, is the problem of the balance between the degrees of centralization and the degrees of decentralization within the public sector, within the private sector, and between the public and the private sector. That is a, there is a very uh, subtle equilibrium uh, there, what is uh, needed. So, uh, well, I understand I have to finish my remarks because I <laughs> see. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Calvary, do you feel uh, going into uh, uh, Professor Heertje's remarks? You, pardon? Yeah, you feel uh, going into Professor Heertje's remarks right now? No, I want to hear you. You want to hear me? <laughs> <laughs> I feel you're, you're asking too much now because he, he is such a learned man. I, I can I can get that high, you know. <laughs> I I go <clears throat> very far to accept the comments of my distinguished colleague, and particularly his view of the relationship of macro and microeconomics. I don't think that there are entirely. With, it's entirely possible, impossible to reconcile them with my own comments, and therefore I'm going to uh, reserve a few positions, but give the discussion over to my distinguished friend here. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, if, if, if it's okay with you, I would now switch over to something very actual. And 
actuality is the you, situation of Bill br Clinton. You're bring it, bringing me back to actuality. Uh, yes. <laughs> if, if you want to say it like that, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, shall <clears throat> I shall have to reserve my position on that. <laughs> Four years ago, you were here, and you, you had just finished your book, The Culture of Contentment, and you ended it in a very gloomy way <clears throat> with a requiem, and, and, and we people here in <laughs> Holland reading that book, we, we thought, oh, gee, what's going to happen to the United States? But at the same time, in November 92, uh, Bill Clinton uh, had, had been elected to president. He was not yet in function, but he had been elected. And that fact was for you uh, an, an fact of optimism. You suddenly changed from gloom to hope, and you said, Bill No, no, Clinton, that, that was just the, a slight delay in the situation. I was really anticipating Steve Forbes. <laughs> Very good. But then Bill Clinton uh, governed the United States for years, and in, in his last State of the Union, he said a thing like this The era of big government is over. For too long, over. Our welfare system has undermined the values of family and work instead of supporting them. That sounds like Reagan and Margaret Thatcher together. <laughs> How do you, is your confidence in Clinton still there or has it white watered down? <laughs> well, I still prefer Bill Clinton to any foreseeable alternative. <laughs> I noticed there was a, <clears throat> a deeper view, uh, if I may say so, of that State of the Union address. He said at the beginning, the era of big government is over. He made various other concessions to the center and to the right. And then in the last half of the, the uh, speech, he affirmed all of the old social democratic values uh, from health care to uh, a basic safety net. And so uh, there was this, while no one would ever accuse the President of the United States of playing politics, uh, there was a certain tendency there to uh, satisfy those who are satisfied by oratory and then go on to satisfy in substance those who wanted substance. <laughs> Thank you. It was, I think, a very well-designed speech. Mm -hmm. But now how do you see Clinton's ch chances for re-election? And I think now of Hillary, the budget problems, Paula Jones, the primary colors, the anonymous novel, recession, private debts, and all these drawbacks. Is he still in the picture? Well, you, I have a problem here in contending with somebody who has read the recent newspapers more carefully than I have. <laughs> but uh, and, uh, I have one special plea to make. I would not like to predict the next election for a simple reason. I have discovered over the years that everybody remembers my wrong predictions and everybody forgets my right ones. <laughs> uh, I do think that uh, Mr. Clinton at the moment is in a relatively strong position and uh, uh, I hope that this uh, continues. There's a basic point here which all who follow uh, American political process, uh, well, there are two points. Uh, one I made last night on television. We must never forget that in the American political process, there's a very large element of recreation. Uh, an enormous amount is done 
for the pleasure of giving the e uh, for the pleasure of creating the evidence of a contest, uh, something uh, approaching a uh, football game. Uh, the other and more important point is that we have in the United States, and I hope this never comes to Holland, we have invented the negative commercial, the negative political statement, in which you value not what you're for yourself, but what's wrong with your opposition. And the Republicans in the United States have carried that in these last weeks to extremes where they have done an extraordinarily good job of destroying each other in an election where Mr. Clinton has no competition. Uh, I, don't like, I don't like negative campaigning. Uh, I find it objectionable. But if we have to have it, I very much want the Republicans to do it. <laughs> Uh, uh, Professor Galvin, I, I, I think it is your firm belief that it is not politicians who shape the social agenda, but the trend of the time. Circumstance, as you call it in older books, in earlier books, you speak of the thrust of <laughs> history. And in your view, this cannot be reversed. The welfare state and its basic programs will survive, you say. So that's a, a, a consolation uh, f for the thought that if ever Steve Forbes or any of his comrades would govern the United States, uh, the welfare state uh, will remain. Isn't that an underestimation of what Doles, Gingrich's, maybe Forbes may achieve? No. I, I, I read uh, an article by Lester C. Turov, I think, one of your colleagues mm. and friends in the, in the States, and he is of the opinion that with the contract with America, the United States is on the road back to a Spencerian 19th century capitalism. C could you speak out about that? Oh, I'm delighted. Uh, <laughs> there, I first dismissed the last point. Uh, uh, while there are exceptions, there are many distinguished scholars in the United States, including some at Harvard, who can be quite wrong. <laughs> and uh, I think any notion that we're going back to the world of Herbert Spencer and uh, the Darwinian view of economics can safely be dismissed as academic nonsense. Uh, they, I do believe uh, that the welfare state here in Europe, here in Holland, in the United States, was created not by socialists, not by social democrats, not by professors, but by the thrust of history. Let me give you one or two examples. In my youth in Canada, uh, there was no occasion for health insurance. It was irrelevant because uh, 60, 70 years ago, in the time of which I speak, there was very little that the local physician or hospital had to sell. Uh, medical knowledge was in a very limited framework. It is only as medical knowledge has, has expanded it is only as, uh, as uh, surgical procedures have become much more complicated and much more invasive that we have the need for health insurance because this, with the enormous expansion of medical knowledge, we not only have the much higher cost, but we have a situation in which access to this great wealth of knowledge may mean the difference between life and death, or illness and, mm -hmm. and well-being. And that is something which a civilized society cannot allow. Mm -hmm. when, I, <clears throat> when I first came into economics, the United States, like Holland, was primarily a farm country. 
uh, over half the working population of the, uh, as late as the Roosevelt years, approximately half of the working population was in agriculture or in small village related services. One did not need pensions in that uh, uh, society because for two reasons. First, uh, when a farmer grew old and was no longer able to work, the farm passed to his children and they looked after him. Or it passed to a neighbor and he had the, the, the wherewithal from the farm to live on. Also, retirement, and the, given the age expectation of those years, was relatively short. It is modern industry and modern extension of life expectancy, which makes pensions, social security essential. And the list could go on. Uh, so that uh, while uh, social democrats, as I call myself in Europe, liberals as I call myself at home, while we take credit for great changes, and we bow uh, very effusively when we're credited with them. In fact, these are changes which were brought about not by individuals, not by persons, but by people accommodating to the deeper thrust of history. You're asking those questions, you're in some danger of getting a second lecture. <laughs> so in this sense, you are a Marxist. Beg your pardon? In this sense, you are a Marxist. Uh, the notion that, uh, the modern notion that Marx is totally wrong, uh, uh, I can't wholly accept. I don't regard myself as a Marxist, but I do, I do think that there, there was and is a very great deep process of economic determinism. Do you deny that? No, I, I fully agree with you. Oh, well, we have two... <laughs> we, we have two Marxists here. Yes. <laughs> the only two in the world. <laughs> well, the, these, Mar these two Marxists bring me to Russia. You say uh, history can be re re reversed. But what's going on in Russia at this moment? There, there is a sort of a, of a, a red brown danger coming up with with two uh, dangerous types we don't like and nobody knows for sure what's going to happen i know you know russia since a very long time you've been there i think you were the first western professor of economics who, who spoke in russia who had uh, lectures in, in russia in in the, in the stalin years even so what, what do you see, what's happening there, according to your vision? Well, uh, <clears throat> in the autumn of 1989, somewhat to my surprise, I was invited November of that year, late October maybe, to give some lectures at the Karl Marx University in Leipzig in East Germany. <laughs> <laughs> and I lectured there on the role of pragmatism as against the role of theory in economic life, that you accommodated to practical circumstance rather than controlled by theory. I have always felt that that lecture of mine was what started the great revolution. <laughs> uh, anything that can be done to promote that idea, I would find very satisfying. <laughs> but uh, I come back to the main point. Uh, I think the, that this is the fact that the uh, leaders of the Soviet Union uh, were governed by ideological rules rather than by the accommodation to circumstance, mm -hmm. including the demand for consumers' goods, including the will of people after a certain level of well-being to be heard, uh, freedom of expression, and so forth, and that was a failure to accommodate, the change there came as a failure to accommodate to current reality. That doesn't mean that all aspects of that change were uh, comfortable by any means. Uh, or we had a new ideology that some sudden, some miracle of capitalism would 
uh, allow for a, a wonderful rapid transition uh, to the uh, modern Western state, modern Western economy. And there, again, I think we were badly misled by ideological commitment. It was a much more difficult process than was then seen. Mm -hmm. In the future. <laughs> future. No. I think that this would be a, a psychological moment to ask our auditorium if there are any questions to pose, Professor Gelder. If there are, please come forward and formulate them and you'll certainly get an answer. I'll get you to repeat the question. You have spoken about inflation. You repeat the question. And, 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 and yes, I repeat the question. I, if I understand you well, you, you ask if there is any influence of uh, redistribution of wealth in, in, in the world on inflation and employment. Isn't that so? Yeah, especially on, on employment. I would, that is a very good question and a very important question. And if my lecture had been twice as long, it is certainly one that I would have mentioned, covered. <coughs> there can be no question that the modern market system, the word capitalism has kind of gone, gone up, has become uh, intellectually incorrect. There's no doubt that the modern market system distributes income in a highly unequal fashion and to some extent in a highly erratic way. And therefore, uh, there can be no question, in my mind at least, that one of the elements of the good society is a strongly progressive system of taxation, that this is absolutely essential. And as I say, it's possibly uh, to my discredit that I didn't give that more emphasis in the lecture that you just heard. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, please. Yes. I uh, would like to uh, make the suggestion that it could be better to fight inflation by uh, fighting catalyzation than by... Uh, by what? By, by fighting catalyzation, catalyzation. Pri uh, price arrangements Not than by uh, uh, too much uh, containing the the amount of money, I have two uh, two special information items. I read in the Economist that in England, old, uh, cars are 60% uh, more expensive than in Denmark, uh, apart from taxation, and the cause of this is catalysation among the dealers. And the second item is that in, uh, in Holland, Holland has once been called the uh, cartel paradise, and in Holland, between 1960 and 1990, 1990, not a single question has been asked in Parliament about unofficial cartels and therefore my suggestion is and I would like to hear the opinion of Professor Galbraith about this my question is uh, is, the, is done enough to fight inflation by fighting cartels <laughs> is it, you, you got it you want to summarize is, is, it is, 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 <laughs> is, is there done enough <laughs> In, in this country and, and maybe everywhere, to fight inflation by uh, by grabbing the cartels. Now, I, this is the issue. I I would not agree. Uh, <clears throat> there is a case against uh, monopoly and the and monopolistic exploitation 
of the consumer. But generally speaking, I feel that that issue, cartelization, monopolization, has sunk into the background. It was once a very important feature, particularly of American politics. We led the world in our commitment to antitrust enforcement. But various factors have intervened and, as I say, put that issue back in the shadows. For one thing, the global nature of the modern economy makes the control within any country difficult, possibly impossible. Second, with a high standard of living, the amount of suffering that is result, could result from occasional monopolization, the occasional cartelization of products, is something that can be suffered. It isn't something about which we should get as excited as we were in the last century when it operated to a substantial extent against urgent necessities. It operated then against some marginal things too. One of our greatest cartels in the last century in the United States was in tobacco. But the combination of a high diverse standard of living and a global uh, trading system causes me to put that issue rather into the uh, uh, background. I think it's uh, interesting that it was raised, important that it was raised, but uh, it is not something which any longer uh, commands my first concern. We also have a, another point that has to be made. We also have worked into the modern system a process for countering uh, cartel power. And that is something which I have written about, urged over the years, the tendency where you have p power of that sort to have countering power against it. Where one has consumers' goods that are monopolized uh, to the extent they are, one has the countervailing power of the modern supermarket chain. Uh, there's an equalizing process that has worked into the system which has also put this issue into the shadows. <clears throat> there was once a time in the United States when the, after the cabinet positions themselves, the most famous person in Washington was the antitrust prosecutor. Now nobody even knows his name or her name. It has, as I say, disappeared from the public consciousness. I'm sorry about that too because I once taught antitrust law and I was, and I was rendered obsolete by those social forces that I've already mentioned. <laughs> Professor Galbraith, the self-destructive tendency of modern capitalism begins with the large corporation, a quote from your culture of contentment. Uh, do you see any future for the large corporation? Uh, that would be one question. Another one is that uh, in early 1987, uh, you made a prediction that is still remembered uh, with respect to the level of the Dow Jones at the time. I believe it was something like 3,000, but I'm not sure. At the moment, and in October 87, we did see uh, a substantial decline of some 30%. You warrant against this uh, overheating of the market. At the moment, the Dow Jones is touching, time and again, 5,600. What are your feelings uh, today as to the level of the market? You repeat it. Uh, yes. First question is, uh, how do you see the future of the great corporations? Not the corporations. And, and, the, and then the second is, uh, what do you say about uh, the, the actual level of the Dow Jones index, mm -hmm. more than 500? 5,600. 5,600. Well, the first question, the, the answer to the first question is uh, 
something which I would especially stress. Uh, there is a, an unquestioned institutional change which, uh, to, with which we cannot control and perhaps shouldn't try to control. And one of those is the development of the economic, of the business firm and the corporation, including the large corporation. We may not like it, but it is part of a larger process that I think lies beyond the reach of economic action. As to the whether there's a uh, element of speculation in present common stocks in New York and elsewhere, I wouldn't doubt. And uh, while I don't want to make predictions, I would not tonight uh, uh, affirm the stability of the Dow Jones Index. How is that for an evasive, <laughs> evasive answer? <laughs> Please come forward if you can. Over here. Microphone oh, oh, you have a, you yeah. have a mic. Yeah. Uh, I can't even formulate it as a question, but I wonder if you could comment on how, I've been trying to follow politics in the States, and on how people who are less than super rich or rich can uh, seemingly want this flat tax that this Steve Forbes seems to be offering. I wonder if you could offer any comment on that. How people who are less than rich can f fall for this flat tax offered by this Steve yeah. Forbes? You comment on the flat, flat tax by Forbes. What? You comment on the flat yeah, tax. Yeah, you comment on the flat, flat tax. Oh. <laughs> and how people are the left and the right can support. The, the, the question is the flat tax. You must wonder why I came to Holland at this particular moment. It, it was to escape discussion of the flat tax. <laughs> uh, it, I, I said in my uh, prepared remarks that you have to allow in this world for a certain element of stupidity verging on insanity. And that is certainly applicable to the flat tax. <laughs> which would, uh, it's an incredible thing. It would lower taxes on the rich, exempt all income and dividend revenues from taxation, and would uh, increase taxes on people of middle income and poor. Uh, this is, uh, it would, it is generally supposed have an extremely favorable effect on Mr. Forbes' own income. Uh, they, uh, the reaction to the flat tax should be that one of the charms of the United States is that no proposal of an economic sort is entirely impossible. <laughs> One more. I just suggested we have one more question. You should. Yeah, is, is there you, one more question? You should understand that. Yes, I. Sorry. You should understand that a lecture is essentially an authoritarian exercise, <laughs> and, and one has a few questions has questions afterward only for the sake of giving a slightly fraudulent aspect of democracy. <laughs> I would like to ask a question on the topic of land that you raised. Uh, I do believe that you spoke of land in a very uh, old-fashioned way, and you uh, declined to mention natural resources. And if we follow conflicts in the world, whether it is Falklands War or Desert Storm, or now with islands between Korea, Japan, China, Taiwan, it is very much natural resources that give land maybe a new meaning in, uh, in, in the current actuality of economics and a threat of war with the economic uh, consequences of war. Could you comment on that maybe, please? 
You got it? You get it? Uh, well, yes. <laughs> what about uh, the, the issue of natural resources is not becoming more important than the issue of land? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I've never, the question is broadly speaking, whether natural resource supplies are more important than land. Yeah. Yeah. This is something I must confess uh, to which I have given very little thought. Um, we, we have a long run problem and maybe a short run problem of natural resource uh, conservation. One of my friends over the many years including the time I spent in Asia, is the Dalai Lama, who was visiting us in Cambridge, Massachusetts a few weeks ago. And he made a comment to me in conversation, which I'm still puzzling about. He said, you're in favor of economic development. And I said, yes. And you particularly want to see it in the poor countries. And I said, yes. He said, well, what will this world be like when everybody has an automobile? Uh, it's a puzzling question. Uh, they, that we have the possibility, a greater possibility of natural resource exhaustion than we have of available land is quite possible. But I must say it's a matter to which I must confess I've given very little attention. Looking at the clock, I think uh, I will... Uh, ask you one more last question and a, a very international one. Like your longtime friend Jan Tinbergen, who advocated a world government, you set great store by the United Nations, which must be paid for by the rich countries, you say, and as you say, quite definitely the United States. Can one still believe in this organization that in former Yugoslavia was outclassed by NATO, and because of the defaulting, United States is on the verge of bankruptcy. <laughs> this is a, a more than adequate question on which to conclude. It allows me to say one thing very seriously, that this is one of the rare times when I have come to Holland when I haven't had the pleasure of meeting and talking with the individual which in my lifetime has been my, the model I consider as the greatest person in economic life, and that's Jan Tinbergen. Uh, and uh, it is a point of sorrow for me to come to Holland and not any longer see that very great economist, one of the greatest socially oriented figures of our time. What was the rest of the question? <laughs> can the United Nations, can they exist without the dough they need from the United States? Well, it's, there is, it has become fashionable in some parts of the United States and some parts of the world to attack the United Nations. I am a strong defender of the United Nations. It is the closest approach we have to world order and world government. One of the shocking things in American, modern American policy is that we do not support the United Nations to the extent that our obligations require or suggest. And as long this, given our closest approach to an orderly supervision of world power, I conclude that we must uh, support the United Nations. We must see it as the, an absolutely essential instrument, and we must do anything possible to make it more effective. Let us not be at all backward in our support of the UN.
Professor Galbraith, thank you. Thank you, Professor Heertje and Dr. Bijshuizen for making this evening for all of us already history. Um, Professor um, Galbraith will sign a limited amount of books, and it's been a very long day. Catch your train, have a drink, come again. Thanks. <laughs>